Unit 9, Part 2 is the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are the most common complication uh, in obey. There is a 12 to 22 percent occurrence rate. And around the world, they are the second leading cause of death. In other countries, the um, most common cause of death is postpartum hemorrhage. Um, but eclampsia and other hypertensive disorders are a serious um, threat to the health and well-being of moms and babies. Um, so we'll begin. So there are four basic types of hypertension in pregnancy. Um, and hypertension here is defined as a blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 over 90. We have chronic hypertension, and this is any hypertension that is diagnosed before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Um, so that includes a mom who didn't have a history but came for prenatal care, or maybe on her second prenatal visit had a blood pressure that was elevated um, into the hypertensive range. Um, we have gestational hypertension, and gestational hypertension is hypertension that has its onset after 20 weeks gestation, but there is no proteinuria. Now what's important to note is that um, a lot of chronic hypertensives, maybe up to 25%, become preeclamptic, which is the next category, and about 50% of people with gestational hypertension will develop preeclampsia. Um, so if there's no protein, it's considered gestational, but we're still going to keep testing mom um, to see if she has proteinuria, because at some point she may go into uh, preeclampsia. Preeclampsia has its onset after 20 weeks. It is a multi-system event, and we're going to discuss the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Um, we have hypertension, at least 140 over 90, um, and there is proteinuria. You're going to get protein that is 1 plus um, on a urine dipstick. which equals uh, 300 milligrams um, per deciliter. And that would be measured in a 24-hour urine collection. So periodically, women at risk will be screened um, with a 24-hour urine. Once they are screened positive for protein urea, we stop because they've met the criteria. Um, and there's no real association with outcomes and the degree of protein urea. The fourth type of hypertension in pregnancy is probably the most dangerous type, and that's chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. And that means that the mom was hypertensive before 20 weeks, but she develops proteinuria or she develops other features of preeclampsia. And when we discuss preeclampsia, you'll understand why platelet count could be decreased um, or why liver enzymes might be elevated. Um, but we'll kind of go on through that as we discuss the different types. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about chronic hypertension. Um, most of our discussion of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy will focus on preeclampsia and eclampsia. Um, and that is most likely what you'll see on exams and on ATI and on um, your NCLEX um, in terms of pregnancy and hypertension. But we will talk very briefly about chronic hypertension because it's a problem that we're seeing more frequently. Um, it is hypertension that's diagnosed before 20 weeks. Um, if mom is pregnant or planning to become pregnant, um, it's important that her prescribers not give her ACE inhibitors, which are teratogenic. And we try to avoid the use of diuretics except as a last resort. I have seen some women who have had horribly uncontrolled blood pressures sometimes be prescribed an agent like HCTZ, but it's more commonly done postpartum. Remember that mom needs that extra fluid volume. Um, so we don't really um, want to do anything that's going to decrease her um, circulating volume um, unless we absolutely have to to get that blood pressure under control. Um, Something else that I'm going to point out is that because you have vasoconstriction, um, you have an increased risk of both intrauterine growth retardation, which is, um, I'm sorry, let me correct that spelling there, um, 
it's not mental retardation. Growth retardation, or IUGR for short, is a restriction in the fetal growth so that the size is less than the fifth percentile. Um, we also sometimes see placental abruption um, because of vasospasm. Um, when those vessels keep constricting and then dilating, um, we can have like a shearing effect on the placenta. Um, and we'll discuss placental abruption as a separate problem. Um, but these are some things that you should know about chronic hypertension. The agents of choice for treating this are labetalol or trandate. Um, let me see if I can put that in there. And labetalol is a good medication for pregnancy. It's considered safe. Um, but one of its uh, actions is that it can vasodilate, and it has particular benefit um, to increasing blood flow through the placenta to the fetus. Um, Labetal also has a wide range of therapeutic um, effectiveness. You can start it at, say, 100 milligrams BID. Um, if that doesn't work, you can go up to 200. You can go up to 300. You can go up to TID dosing. Um, so there's a wide um, therapeutic range for labetalol. And so um, it's one of the first line agents that we use for chronic hypertension. Another agent that is sometimes used is Aldamet. Um, I used to see it a little bit more frequently. Aldamet has some side effects that are a little bit more um, troublesome for most people than labetalol. Um, labetalol tends to be very well tolerated in pregnancy. Aldamet can cause dry mouth, sedation, um, dizziness, but it is still used sometimes for chronic hypertension in pregnancy. And the last agent that we use um, routinely is Procardia, also known as nifedipine. It is a calcium channel blocker. Um, interestingly enough, it also has a mild tocolytic effect, although um, we'll talk a bit more about tocolytics when we talk about labor at risk and preterm labor. Um, but procardia also um, can increase the blood supply to, through the placenta to the fetus. So those are some agents that we use to treat hypertension in pregnancy. And I don't want you to get too fixated on um, chronic hypertension. It is good to know about it. Um, however, our, most of our discussion is going to be focused on um, preeclampsia and eclampsia, so let's move on to that. So just to review what we've already talked about, preeclampsia is hypertension um, with proteinuria after 20 weeks of gestation. Um, and we're going to discover why it's a multi-system disease, what makes you get that proteinuria, and how it's so dangerous, how it becomes so dangerous to mom. Okay, so the cause of preeclampsia is not entirely known. However, um, there are some really good observations that come up in the research. Let me see if I can find them, find a picture of what I want to talk to you about. Okay, and I don't know if you guys remember when I talked in uh, genetics conception, fertilization, and fetal development about the growth of the placenta. I only really touched on it briefly, um, but you can see here, all the way on the left, and let's kind of call attention to that. There is what spiral arteries look like in the um, endometrium when a woman isn't pregnant. Um, and that sort of supplies the endometrium with blood, but not too much. You can see that they're very tightly screwed. There's like a real um, tight winding of those spiral arteries. And what's going to happen is when that lining is... Um, shed at the end of a cycle, they're going to contract, vasoconstrict, and mom is going to bleed but not hemorrhage. Okay, so that is sort of what that's about. Now, if you look over here to the normal pregnancy, okay, you can see that there's a remodeling that takes place. And here, this right here, that vessel really dilates and opens up and this um, spiral sorts to, starts to unwind a little bit. And what that's going to do is allow more blood flow to that placenta. Um, and you can't see, but in between all of those um, maternal blood vessels, you have the chorionic villi and then reservoirs fill up and supply the placenta and that fetus with lots of um, blood flow. That's what normally happens. Now in preeclampsia, let's change color so you can see this, this is sort of what happens. There's a little remodeling that takes place, but not enough. 
And so the placenta doesn't get a good um, blood supply. And it starts to send out distress signals. Um, and these distress signals go out into maternal circulation and they cause um, endothelial activation. Hold on, let me kind of get rid of some of this. Okay, so what happens um, when you get this inadequate remodeling? You get a lack of oxygen to the placenta. That placental ischemia is going to send out, is going to lead to the sending out of chemicals into the mom's circulation. Um, and that's going to sort of start an inflammatory response in the endothelium. Endothelium, remember, is the lining in the arteries. You're going to get a vasospasm because um, those vessels are all going to be more responsive to your vasopressors like angiotensin II. Um, and you're going to get damage to all these little arterioles. Um, additionally, you're going to end up with leaking, like that capillary leaking, um, into the third space. You're going to get deposits of fat and microemboli. Oops, let's see if I can do this without autocorrect. Um, in the liver, you're going to get a decrease blood flow to the kidneys. And let me sort of explain what that means. Okay, so you've got this little cascade of events. It starts out very early in pregnancy. And um, if it's a mild event, you'll see a milder um, preeclampsia. But you can get very severe preeclampsia. We'll talk about the difference between the two. But you have this inadequate remodeling. You have the placental ischemia. Then you have, um, you activate this inflammatory response in the endothelium and you have vasospasm. So you restrict the blood supply not only to the placenta, but to all the organs. So you get sort of ischemic um, damage to all these little organs and they send out cytokines um, in response. The arterioles, after all of this vasospasm and all of the endothelial inflammation, um, the arterioles get damaged. You have leaking of fluid into the third space and this is where you get um, a lot of your edema. Edema is no longer considered diagnostic for preeclampsia. I'm gonna put one more thing on here, just as I'm remembering it as we're talking. Um, but it is common because you do have this um, extravasation. Now, what ends up happening is that you have like a v intravascular depletion with an extravasation of fluid. So these people look very puffy. They've got plus three, plus four pitting edema in their lower extremities, in their face, in their fingers, even in their abdomen. Um, but they are actually kind of dry on the inside. So, um, you know, they're dehydrated intravascularly in the space. So you have that. Um, you have deposits of fat and microemboli in the liver. That's where you'll get your elevated liver enzymes um, and liver activation with this disease. You have um, decreased blood flow to the kidneys um, and a decreased a GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Um, and you'll get some cerebral edema. And when we talk about the signs and symptoms, this is sort of why it's important to understand a little bit of the pathophysiology because... Um, when you're looking at this, this is not just a disease of hypertension. Hypertension is really a symptom of the systemic inflammation and vasospasm that happens. It's not the cause of things. The blood pressure is not the root cause. The root cause is this endothelial dysfunction. Okay, and that's um, going to help you remember when we start to see things like headaches, that blinding headache that preeclamptics get, the spots in front of their eyes. You have little, um, the arterioles in their retina. Um, can have dysfunction. And so they have um, photophobia and what's called scotoma or blurred vision and spots in front of their eyes, double vision. Um, you'll have increased risk for seizures and that's your cerebral edema. You'll have decreased urine output and you'll have protein in the urine. Um, remember, if you're leaking, if those arterioles are leaking, they're leaking out the protein. Um, so that's where your proteinuria come from. The deposits of fat, the microemboli in the liver, are what drive your um, liver enzymes up and what can drive your platelets down. Um, so these are it's a multi-system um, series of events that happens with preeclampsia. Um, it's not just about hypertension. 
and just a brief discussion of um, what the risk factors are for preeclampsia. Um, although it doesn't always um, associate with these risk factors, we do find a higher incidence of preeclampsia in certain patients. For example, um, women who are pregnant for the first time, um, your prima gravidus, and women who are pregnant by a um, new dad. And that points to some immunologic factors that may be um, at play with the, the um, remodeling of the spiral arteries. We also see um, a higher incidence at women who are younger than 19 or greater than 35. Some sources say greater than 40, but your extremes of age is another risk factor. Um, anybody with a pre-existing disease that causes either low-level um, endothelial dysfunction, like pre-existing diabetes, or um, a tendency to vasospasm, like your pre-existing hypertensives or people who have renal disease, those folks are also at risk. Also, anybody with periodontal disease, we're finding that the inflammation associated with um, periodontal disease is also related to preeclampsia as well as preterm labor. Um, African American women have a higher incidence. And anything where you have a placenta or multiple placentas that demand more um, perfusion than, typic than what's typical. For example, your, your multiple gestations, twins, um, and what's called a molar pregnancy, a hydatidiform mole, um, which is a condition we'll cover like a couple of um, videos down from this one, where there's actually not a growing fetus. Um, there's a series of undifferentiated cells um, that grow a very large placenta, um, which sort of points to the fact that this, is, that this disease is really um, a disease of placental malfunction and endothelial dysfunction and obesity, um, also because it predisposes people to the underlying pathology. Okay, so um, now that we know what preeclampsia is and who might be more at risk to get it, we can talk about how it runs along a spectrum from mild to severe. And what we consider to be mild disease, and it's still a serious thing, um, is blood pressure um, less than 160 over 110. So somewhere between 140 over 90 and 160 over 110. Um, liver function studies within normal limits, or at least not um, severely elevated. If it's, we'll talk about what's severe, how high they have to be for it to be severe. Um, platelets within normal limits. Um, normal lung function, no pulmonary edema. No visual or central nervous system disturbances. So you're not getting that blinding headache or um, the spots in front of your eyes or the double vision. Um, and you want to see creatinine and uric acid within normal limits. Okay. Um, so those are the things that we look for. That's mild disease. Again, still serious. You still have a high pressure. Um, and you're still at risk for all these other things. Now, now when we start talking about severe preeclampsia, um, there are some pretty ominous signs and symptoms that we might see. Um, and I'm going to start listing them. So we have our blood pressure, um, which will be equal to or greater than 160 over 110. Um, and remember, blood pressure is supposed to go down in pregnancy, so it's always a weird thing when it doesn't. So your blood pressure is equal to or greater than 160 over 110. These are the signs. You will have um, sometimes thrombocytopenia. Um, and that's one of the features of HELP syndrome, but you'll have platelets that are lower than 100,000. Um, that's sort of your hallmark. If they're a little bit low, if they're 114, 120, something along those lines, you wanna watch them, um, but it's not considered a severe feature at that point. Impaired liver function. And these you do your liver studies, and you see AST is elevated, ALT, sometimes LDH. Don't worry about alkaline phosphatase. That's not one of your elevated liver enzymes in um, HELP syndrome. What we um, 
associate that with is bone growth in the fetus, and almost every pregnant woman has an elevated alkaline phosphatase, so don't worry about that one. AST, ALT, LDH, um, and you'll see impaired renal function. We've already got the proteinuria, but now we might have a serum creatinine of 1.1 or more. Um, that's definitely a sign of worsening preeclampsia. We might see oliguria. Um, we might see evidence of pulmonary edema. And remember, when we've got those that damage to all those arterioles, the fluid sort of leaks, and we, we start to see CNS disturbances, and that I'm gonna put under symptoms. So let's put your signs here. Whoops, hold on. Let's see if we can fix that. There we go. Now you get all your signs. These are all signs. And I'm going to put symptoms in blue over here. Okay. So your symptoms would be your CNS disturbances, among other things. You're going to look at a severe frontal headache. And this is not a headache that goes away with Tylenol or rest. This is a headache that um, just kind of keeps on going and it gets worse and worse. Um, and that's from cerebral edema. We might get um, visual disturbances. And by that we're talking about double vision, blurred vision, spots in front of the eyes, floaters. Um, those things are definitely big warning signs. Um, photophobia is another one. Um, we're going to see epigastric pain, and this is from your liver dysfunction. I don't know why this autocorrect does that, but... Okay, so epigastric pain, and you're looking at right upper quadrant, that's where your liver is. What happens is you might have microemboli, or you might have fat deposits, or you might have swelling under the liver capsule if you get a little bit of bleeding. Um, and these are all warning signs. Um, now another sign, or those are symptoms, another sign that you might find here, let's put this down here, um, let's move this a little bit, um, increased, or well, here, hold on, hyperreflexia. So you're going to check these um, DTRs, plus three, plus four. And when you get that hyperreflexia, you better watch out. Make sure that you have some seizure precautions in place because this might progress to eclampsia. Eclampsia is um, this preeclampsia that has progressed until you have a seizure. And um, when we talk about magnesium sulfate, we're going to talk about how we prevent seizures, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we might do to treat them. Um, but that hyperreflexia is another sign um, that we can observe in a patient who has severe preeclampsia. Um, so we're going to move on to some management. Um, how do we manage preeclampsia? Well, it depends on whether it's mild or severe, as you can imagine. So for mild, let's make that blue. It's mostly expectant management. So we increase our um, maternal and fetal surveillance. So we're going to check mom's blood pressure more often. And we're going to check her labs, um, particularly those liver enzymes, the serum creatinine, the uric acid, um, her platelets. We want to look at that. And we're going to do maybe some NSTs. Um, definitely we're going to teach mom fetal kick counts. And we're going to teach her to report the signs and symptoms of um, worsening PIH. Let's see if I can fix that a little bit. Um, now, of course, if mom's NSTs aren't reactive, what are we going to do about that? We're going to order the BPP, the biophysical profile. And of course, if mom gets less than 8 out of 10, um, we're going to evaluate and see if she's ready to deliver. Okay? Because now we're going to talk about severe preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. Okay, so 
Let's talk a little bit about HELP syndrome because we really have not addressed that subject yet. So HELP syndrome is a variation of severe preeclampsia and what it means is the H is hem hemolysis and this is um, the destruction of red blood cells as part of the pathophysiology. The EL, the first EL is elevated liver enzymes and again that's we're talking about ALT, AST and sometimes LDH and they will be double that of normal or even higher. I have seen them climb very high um, and low platelets and you can get platelets that go very very low. Um, down to 19, um, 14 I've seen. And um, the course of the disease just deteriorates very quickly once you're in HELP syndrome. And this is one of the reasons that women around the world still die from preeclampsia. Um, what you end up with is a woman in multi-organ system failure. The kidneys shut down, the liver shuts down. Um, and then, of course, if she has those CNS changes, you can end up with a CVA, which is a stroke, or you can end up... Um, because you can have bleeding into the brain, it would be a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, or you can have a mom who goes into DIC, you can have um, a lot of variations on this. Women bleed to death, um, they have seizures that don't stop. Um, so HELP syndrome is something that you really want to be aware of. Once you get into HELP syndrome, um, you're really into a place where you have not a lot of choices as far as management. So let's talk about the management of severe preeclampsia, and that includes eclampsia and HELP syndrome. Okay. So, just to call your attention to one thing, delivery is the only cure. You gotta get that kid out um, because it's the placenta that's making mom sick. So you have to deliver a baby and or a placenta. Um, if there's no baby, if it's a molar pregnancy, you have to evacuate the uterus of all of its contents. Um, and you have to make sure that you get the fragments. There are cases of postpartum preeclampsia, um, just to make you aware that that can happen up to two weeks post-delivery. But really getting that baby out is the way that we cure this disease. Um, now, here's the problem. We have two patients, and sometimes one of our patients might not be ready to be born. Maybe that patient is 22 weeks and already compromised. Um, we have the risks to the baby of um, IUGR, and we'll sort of talk about that um, in a little bit. But basically, um, we're weighing one against the other. So there are very complicated decision trees, they call them. It's sort of an if this, then that model. And I don't want to get you completely overwhelmed with that, but do know that um, providers weigh the risks versus benefits of delivery versus expected management to both patients. In the end, the mom sort of has to win. Um, because without a viable mom, we don't get a viable baby. So, um, if we are delivering, we have the choice of induction methods or um, C-section. If it's really something that has to happen right now, it's gonna end up being a C-section. Um, but you wanna be careful in the mom that has very low platelets because a C-section is a bloodier delivery. Um, okay, so. Um, if we decide on um, a little bit more expectant management, we might be looking at a medication called magnesium sulfate. So let's kind of take a detour into magnesium sulfate. And, okay. Now, if you haven't already done template on this, get your uh, ATI templates out because we're going to talk about mag. Why do we use mag? It prevents seizures. Um, a lot of students might think that it lowers the blood pressure, when in fact it does that as a side effect. But that's not really what we're trying to um, do here. We're not curing hypertension, like essential hypertension. We're trying to um, prevent seizures. There is no direct medication, by the way, that actually addresses the pathophysiology. Um, it does not address that endothelial dysfunction. Although they are working with baby aspirin to prevent preeclampsia. Um, the best that we can hope for is that we prevent all of the major um, complications of this disease. So magnesium sulfate. 
Um, there may be other antihypertensives. They will be the same ones that we discussed in chronic hypertension. But if we are looking at a mom with severe hypertension or severe preeclampsia um, or features of HELP syndrome, we're going to use mag sulfate. Um, and what we're doing is a therapeutic toxicity. It's really not toxic toxic, and we'll sort of talk about some numbers. So normal magnesium. How many of you remember fluid and electrolytes? We talked about Maggie who swam in the ocean. She was one and a half to two and a half years old. So that is your normal mag level, one and a half to two and a half. I know you guys have seen some books that say 1.7 to 2.6 or some variation on that theme, but a good rough guide is 1.5 to 2.5. Therapeutic for preeclampsia or preterm labor, which is another subject for a different day, um, is going to be 4 to 7, but we have a very narrow window before we go into true toxicity, which is 8 or above. Okay, um, so what we're doing is we're putting mom into a hypermagnesemic state, okay? And that is going to prevent seizures. Do you remember I said that um, you're going to have these exaggerated reflexes, these DTRs, hyperreflexia? Well, magnesium um, is going to lower the CNS irritability um, that you get with that cerebral edema. Um, so your DTRs should hopefully go down to like 1 plus, 2 plus. However, we're going to check our DTRs every hour because once they start to disappear, we start to worry about magne magnesium toxicity. If you're losing your DTRs, the next thing you're going to lose is your breathing reflex. So you are going to decrease the DTRs. Um, it will vasodilate as a side effect. And these moms are going to get hot, hot, hot. Um, you know, I remember putting buckets of ice water in washcloths and saying, you know what, when you start to feel that hot feeling, that flushed feeling, they get so red, they start to perspire. You take those washcloths that are in that bucket of ice and sort of put them wherever they feel good, on your neck, on your pulse points, and that does help as a comfort measure. However, that vasodilation also does increase some circulation to the baby. It isn't something we want to carry on long term, um, but especially if we're looking at maybe giving this baby 48 hours to get steroids on board. Um, that vasodilation does have a neuroprotective effect, and we'll discuss that in more length when we talk about preterm delivery. Um, remember that most of the time, if we've got a mom who's 34, 35 weeks, and she's got PIH, pre I'm sorry, it's not called PIH anymore, but preeclampsia, um, we're probably going to recommend delivery, or some, you know, a perinatologist will probably recommend delivery. If she's in that in-between, in that 24 to 34 weeks, um, what they're probably going to recommend, depending on the severity of the disease, is um, preparation with steroids and magnesium for 48 hours um, and then delivery if, you know, if things are getting worse. Um, so magnesium is going to have that as a side effect. Typically, um, we're going to start with a 4 I think your book might say four to six gram bolus. I remember giving some six gram boluses, but we're gonna say four to six gram bolus with more, um, oh my, um, more likely towards the four, okay? You're gonna give that bolus over 20 minutes, okay? So you're gonna get that mom therapeutic quickly and it's gonna feel like crap for her. Um, she's gonna start feeling hot. She's gonna feel flu-like. She's going to get a headache that can, it's a little bit different from the headache you get from worsening preeclampsia, um, but she might get that sort of hangover type feeling. Um, that's sort of what Meg feels like. It feels like a cross between the flu and a hangover. Um, for anyone who's ever had it, they can tell you exactly how they felt. It felt awful. They felt hot. They felt flushed. They felt um, like a rag doll. They had no strength. They felt weak. Um, that is what magnesium sulfate therapy feels like. Once we get rid of that four to six gram bolus, that's complete in 20 minutes. And we'll practice some math problems to give that. Um, we are going to give somewhere between one and four grams per hour. Typically, um, 
for preeclampsia, you're going to see two grams per hour. Okay. For preterm labor, you could see one. You could see um, higher doses in more severe, but most of the time, what you're going to see is two grams per hour. Now, to this end, most of the time we have standardized bags because this is a very high risk medication. Um, we're going to talk about side effects, and again, you can get. Um, hypotension, it will reduce the blood pressure, and that might be a good thing for a mom with um, preeclampsia. It's not our primary purpose. We are trying to decrease seizures or prevent seizures. That is the primary purpose of MEG. If you see that on a test question, remember that we are doing this um, to decrease seizures, okay? So, but you might get hypotension. You might get that warmth, flushing, um, Mom reports weakness, fatigue. She's at higher risk for falls. Um, she might have a mild headache. Now, if she's developing worsening preeclampsia, she's going to have a headache anyway. But those are some of your side effects. So if you're filling in your templates now, remember to put that there. Um, let's see if we can sort of make this a little bit smaller because we have more stuff to add with mag okay um, the adverse effects of mag we have a high risk of toxicity with magnesium sulfate particularly in women who have um, decreased kidney function in fact somebody who has renal insufficiency you can kill them with mag um, we had a patient who came in, I want to say it was about a year ago. No, it had to be more than that. It had to be about a year and a half ago because we were still at RMC. Um, and this mom had a whole gaggle of issues. She had um, renal insufficiency. She had a history of gastric bypass, a history of type 2 diabetes. Um, she had a history of infertility. And she was now pregnant at 43 years of age um, with her second child went into severe preeclampsia. She was on verapamil, which we don't see a whole lot of in pregnancy. We had to like sort of look it up and say, well, how does this work with pregnancy? Um, and it turned out if you magged her, um, we really could have killed her. So uh, that was sort of a bad situation. We ended up having to deliver that baby at 27 weeks. And the baby was just really premature and um, had a lot of IUGR issues because you have that decreased perfusion of the placenta and you have decreased fetal growth. So um, you also have decreased respiratory function. If you're knocking out your DTRs, you're also knocking, um, you're also decreasing your respiratory um, centers, the activity that's there. Um, so you need to watch this mom um, count her respirations and look at her um, for breathing. You have a slightly increased risk for um, pulmonary hypertension, which is already a risk. Sorry, pulmonary edema, forgive me. Thinking of too many things at once. Um, but you do have an increased risk for pulmonary edema. So when you go in every hour to check this mom, you're checking INO, strict INO, because you also have increased risk for um, renal failure. This is not a benign intervention, but it is the best thing we have um, to prevent complications to mom. So the increased risk for pulmonary edema, the increased risk for renal failure. Um, so you go into the room, you check your I and O, you check your, your breath sounds, you look and make sure that mom's not having any um, dyspnea or um, shortness of breath. You're gonna check a pulse ox, um, count respers, like I said, you're going to check your DTRs. Um, once we get to the point where we're hyporeflexic, mom is the most likely toxic. She could have levels at eight or above, um, but we're going to look for um, hyporeflexia. So we're going to check those DTRs. I'm going to repeat all of this, um, but we can, we can get mom pretty toxic. Um, so that's something important to remember. Now, 
what is the antidote for magnesium, you guys? Your mag your uh, medication templates, and I'm not looking for anything too fancy here. Let's see. So the antidote for magnesium toxicity is calcium gluconate. This is another thing for your templates. Um, and what we give this in, it's a one gram. It's in a 10% solution in 10 mLs. Um, and it's given IV push. Now where I work, um, let's see if we can fix this, over three minutes. It has to be a slow IV push. You cannot give this rapidly. Okay? Um, okay. Providers are the only ones allowed to give it where I work. Now it used to be that nurses could give it and it could be that somewhere where you work an RN is licensed to give this. We used to tape it to the pump. Now, of course, with Joint Commission, we're not really allowed to have loose meds in the room. Um, so it just has to be readily available. And it's one of those things that, you know, if mom is starting to show signs, if she's got respiratory depression, let's say her respirations are less than 12, she's got no DTRs, um, maybe she doesn't have um, renal output, you walk into the room and you see this and you're thinking, wow, this lady is, and she's maybe got altered level of consciousness. The um, first thing that you're going to do is turn off that mag get a stat mag level, and you're gonna make sure that calcium gluconate is available and you're gonna let your provider know. Okay, um, so you would give calcium gluconate 10% in a 10 ml solution. You have to give it slowly. And the purpose of this, when you're looking at the therapeutic uses, are to, um, to correct the hypermagnesemia due to magnesium sulfate therapy for preeclampsia and preterm labor. Now, um, there are other reasons to give calcium gluconate. For the purpose of your templates, for us, and for the purpose of learning about OB nursing, you really don't need to know those other uses. Just know that it corrects. It's the antidote for magnesium toxicity, okay, related to mag sulfate therapy, okay? Now, um, let's see. We're gonna talk about the adverse effects, if we can. Um, adverse effects. Uh, rapid administration can lead to arrhythmias, um, bradycardia, and severe hypotension. And we might already have that going on. Okay, so that's your adverse effects. That's just from rapid administration. Now, if you extravasate, You'll get, wow, um, you will get cellulitis. Um, if you give it improperly as an IM or a sub-Q, you can also get tissue necrosis, okay? This is a very strong solution. It is very um, caustic to the tissues. You really need to be in a big vein to give this. Um, one of the reasons that you really want the provider to be able to do it here. Let's shrink that. So those are your adverse effects. If you're filling out your template, pause this movie for a little bit and fill that in, okay? Poof, gone. Okay, so your contraindications, obviously. If your mag is therapeutic, or if you are hypercalcemic, which should not be the case, but if it is, you don't give calcium gluconate. Okay, um, as far as medications interaction, you really want to give this in a line all by itself. There are many, many, many drugs that interact with um, calcium gluconate. Um, so give an IV line with either normal saline or D5W. And if you have something else running, stop it. Flush. Wait a little while, then give it, okay? Um, you don't want to give it at the same time as, say, your antibiotics or whatever. Um, so that is how you administer that. And um, don't give, obviously, via IM or sub-Q, nothing but the IV. It works really quickly, though. Um, okay. Client education. If they're getting calcium gluconate, they're really not in the best place to um, educate. It's not the most teachable moment if they're magged out and they're kind of limp and loose on the bed and hardly breathing. 
Um, however, if you're giving it, you can say to the patient, all right, let me know if this burns. And you really need to pay attention while you're pushing it. If you look, if there's any signs and symptoms of infiltration, you want to stop that immediately, start a new line and start over. As far as evaluating the medication's effectiveness, and I'll put that up for your template. Um, look at your mag levels. Obviously, if you've gone from a mag level of 10 or 11 and you're down now to um, 6.8, then it worked. And you're going to monitor your serum, cal serum calcium levels. So that's your calcium gluconate. Now we've talked a lot about the risks to mom. We've talked about the risk of stroke, the risk of kidney failure, the risk of bleeding from thrombocytopenia, the risk of liver failure, and um, the risk of like status epilepticus. If we, we're looking at mom going, um, and she's also got a risk of DIC. So mom has a risk of like multi-organ system failure, but let's look at the risk to the fetus. It was the one thing I don't think we really got a chance to talk about. And um, one of the big things we see is IUGR or intrauterine growth retardation, okay? And when you see the um, baby on ultrasound, this is one of the things that you might monitor for when you're doing that expectant management with a mild preeclamptic. You're gonna look at your fundal height, you're gonna look at, um, at ultrasounds that monitor um, estimated fetal weight. It's not uncommon you have a baby who's um, got, uh, who's been in a preeclamptic intrauterine environment and where a normal 37 or 38 weaker might be um, six and a half to seven pounds, this baby is four and a half, five pounds. So IUGR is one of the risks. Now I just wanna make it clear, some moms will get um, a little bit freaked out when you use the term intrauterine growth retardation because they think that it means the baby has mental retardation. This is not in fact true. It just means that the baby is growing more slowly. Um, and it's one of the reasons that we do all this surveillance. We're doing NSTs, we're doing um, ultrasounds for uh, growth. We might have to do um, those NSTs and VPPs, or we might do Doppler studies to see what the um, blood flow to the baby looks like. Um, so that's one of the risks. And the other risk to the baby um, is preterm delivery. Obviously this baby could be born preterm either as a um, treatment for preeclampsia to save mom from multi-organ system failure and to save baby. Um, so all of the risks of preterm birth are now on this child in addition to the fact that maybe he, he or she grew a little uh, more slowly in utero. Um, another risk that we might see is um, this is sort of a maternal fetal risk, and again, covered as separate content. Um, but babies who are born from a placental abruption, when that placenta separates, suddenly have, um, very abruptly, have their blood flow um, cut off, and they can also exsanguinate um, as the blood flow that goes back through the uterine, I mean, umbilical arteries, starts leaking into the uterus. Um, so, you know, we have the risk of that. Um, and these are all the risks to the fetus from preeclampsia. Okay, so nursing care for preeclampsia. We like to have dark, quiet room um, near the nurse's station, if at all possible. You want them close to the nurse's station so that you can get in there and assess them frequently. But you want them in a dark, quiet room to reduce the um, stimuli um, to the central nervous system. You're going to control the visitors. Everybody, you know, lots of times you'll get patients who have this severe preeclampsia um, and you're really worried that they're going to have a seizure and they've got 20 visitors in the room all making noise um, and really sort of putting that mom at risk. So you need to educate the patient and educate the visitors. Um, putting mom in left lateral position is really optimal for increasing the blood flow to the placenta and to the baby. Um, and we're going to look for signs and symptoms of worsening preeclampsia. We're going to look at their DTRs. We're going to look at for signs and symptoms of um, central nervous system disturbance, we're going to ask mom, are you having any severe headaches? Are you having any spots in front of your eyes? Are you having any double vision, blurred vision? Um, and you're going to ask them if they have any pain up under their ribs on the right side. These will all be signs of worsening preeclampsia. We're going to monitor that INO. 
um, or we may be doing a 24-hour urine if we haven't already done one, if we're ruling out preeclampsia, and we're going to look at their laboratory values and report them promptly. Um, fetal monitoring also falls under um, our umbrella. In most cases, if a woman is hospitalized for preeclampsia, if she is not on magnesium sulfate, we might be doing an hour Q-shift or a non-stress test Q-shift. If she is on magnesium, she's going to have continuous fetal monitoring um, because the baby will feel the effects of the magnesium as well. And we need to assess that. Um, we're also going to administer any medications that are ordered, including magnesium, um, but not exclusive to that. It could be labetalol that we're giving or procardia that we're giving to lower that blood pressure. Um, now, if we're anticipating delivery, we're also going to administer steroids. So remember that. Um, steroids are to help fetal lung maturity. Okay, so those are the nursing, uh, the types of nursing care we're going to give to somebody with preeclampsia. We're also going to educate the patient and the family to report any um, unusual signs or symptoms, um, the ones we've already noticed. And we're just going to take a little detour um, and talk a little bit more about magnesium sulfate. There's a few things that nurses need to know about it. Magnesium sulfate is a high-risk medication, especially as it's administered in OB. Um, and so, at the initiation of the bolus, um, two RNs need to be present, very similar to when you hang heparin. Um, to check and make sure that you're giving the right dose in the right amount, you're setting the pump at the right rate. Um, now for that 20 minute bolus, remember we're giving, um, usually it's four grams over 20 minutes. It could be up to six, could be two. I've seen mostly four. I have given it other ways, but usually you're giving a four gram bolus over 20 minutes. For the first 20 minutes, um, an RN must be at the bedside. Um, and this is to monitor and make sure that no adverse reactions occur. It's very similar to giving a blood transfusion. Um, at the initiation of therapy, um, get a baseline vitals, <clears throat> set of vitals, get a respiratory assessment, excuse me, and do a set of DTRs. At the completion of bolus, okay, get another set of vitals, another respiratory assessment, and another set of DTRs. Okay. <clears throat> Now, two nurses must be present to hang the maintenance infusion. Okay, and just a word about that. Um, typically, the safest thing to do is to have a separate 100 milliliter bag um, for the magnesium sulfate uh, bolus. Then you have a main lot, you know, a maintenance bag, which is your 40 grams in a thousand. Um, and that's the safest thing to do because you can't keep bolusing somebody with that great big bag. It's not what you will always see. In fact, I can tell you where I work, they really don't give you that 100 bag. You just change the rate um, on the pump and you redo the volume to be infused to reflect what you have left in the bag. So you would give, you know, your 100 ml bolus, you have 900 left in the bag, and that's what you'd plug in for the VTBI. But it is safer to have a separate bag for your bolus. Um, now, another safety thing. Um, make sure that the tubing is labeled so that if you have to um, shut it off really quick and keep your main line running, um, you can do that. Um, remember that magnesium sulfate is always spelled out. It is never um, abbreviated as MgSO4, like we used to do in the old days, um, because MgSO4 could be confused for morphine sulfate, MSO4. Um, it's an unapproved abbreviation. Um, you're always going to make sure that you have a hammer in the room so that you can check those DTRs quickly. Always make sure you have a stethoscope in the room so you can check 
you know, you're going to basically check those same things every hour, the vitals, the respiratory assessment, the DTRs, and you're going to do I and O. Um, so for your hourly mag check, let's put that over there. Let's start a new box over here. Um, hourly or as needed. I mean, if you sense that there's a problem with your magnesium, you're going to maybe do this a little bit more often, but you're going to get your vitals, including a pulse ox, respiratory assessment, um, you're going to get DTRs, check for clonus, and we'll talk about clonus in a minute. Clonus is another assessment you can do. Um, clonus is when you dorsiflex the foot. I'll see if I can find a little movie that sort of illustrates that principle. But when you have positive clonus, it looks like the foot starts tapping involuntarily. It's a bad sign. We don't want to ever see clonus, but if you do, you record it in beats. If the foot taps twice, that's two beats of clonus. Clonus is a warning sign that your um, patient's getting ready to seize. So we do our vitals, we do our respiratory assessment, we do DTRs, we do clonus, and we ask them, you know, are you having um, the headache? visual disturbance, um, or epigastric pain. Okay. And hold on one second. I'm going to fix that so you can take a better note. Okay, so this is your mag check. Every hour you're going to do these things. Let me put that, make that a little bit bigger, make that a little bit smaller. Um, so this, this is called a mag check. Also hourly, you are going to do I and O and make sure that that person's renal function is adequate to handle the magnesium. Now when this video is complete, I'm going to um, attach a video on Clonus just so you can see what it looks like. Um, it only takes about 47 seconds. I tried to embed it into this presentation and I could see the picture very clearly and it played while I was um, doing the voice part, but when I played it back, it wouldn't do it. So um, we'll just attach it to the playlist in the middle between um, hypertensive disorders and the next topic. Um, so we'll go on to the next thing, and this is sort of short and sweet. I really want to just talk about um, care of the patient experiencing eclamptic seizure, and there's really not a lot you can do, so this shouldn't take too long. And eclampsia is just um, a word for seizure. It describes a grand mal seizure in a patient who has either preeclampsia or gestational hypertension. Now, eclampsia is one of the leading causes of death from uh, the hypertensive disorders in pregnancy around the world. And in countries that don't have access to good medical care, women do die from um, complications of eclampsia. It's attributed to um, cerebral vasospasm. And as I mentioned, when you're doing all your CNS assessments and you're seeing these brisk um, DTRs and you're seeing clonus and people are having these horrible headaches and the blurred vision, um, this is a person whose central nervous system is very irritable and that little insult from that vasospasm can cause them to have this eclamptic seizure. Um, complications include cerebral hemorrhage. Um, you can have bleeding into the brain. You can have aspiration pneumonia if they're um, if they aspirate while they're seizing. Um, you can have hypoxic encephalopathy if they lose oxygen. Um, you know, a lot of oxygen deprivation during the seizure. You can have um, thromboembolic events, CVAs, you can have maternal death. Um, the death rate in pregnancies that are complicated by eclampsia, according to the resource that I have, is somewhere between 9 and 23%. It probably depends on what part of the world you're in. Um, it sort of depends on, uh, you know, with the infant death, we're looking at gestational age, if you have to develop a very, I mean, um, deliver a very preterm infant at 22 weeks because mom is seizing, that child has um, a very poor prognosis just related to prematurity. On top of that, 
Eclamptic seizures often lead into abruption. If you've got that much um, vasospasm going on um, and you have the added risk of injury from mom having these convulsions where she might actually um, injure her belly on something, um, you have a risk of abruption. And there is intrauterine asphyxia for the um, fetus as well. Um, okay, so here's what we do about it. We First, we try to prevent them. Okay, pad the side rails and keep the person safe. Do not insert anything into the mouth. That includes tongue blades, includes suction catheters, it includes oral airways. If the person stops seizing and you can get an airway in, fine. But while they're seizing, leave them alone. Do not try to shove anything in between their teeth. Um, you wanna try and maintain adequate oxygenation. You might have to administer oxygen via face mask at 10 liters per minute. And that would be a non-rebreather mask. Remember, those are the ones that deliver that 100% flow rate. Um, so we wanna make sure that mag's available. If we're not already giving it, go get someone to run and get you a bag. And if you are already giving it, your provider needs to know that um, the rate's not adequate. And so they're gonna probably order either another bolus or they're gonna order you to jump up the rate. Um, sometimes you can give an additional bolus of two grams. Um, but if mom becomes acidotic, you're going to correct that state. So you might have to get some blood academia, acidemia. Um, you might have to get a blood gas and you might have to um, act on the results that you get. Um, respiratory acidemia is possible after a seizure. Um, and I'll tell you some of my stories with that. I've only had two incidents of um, eclamptic seizure. Um, you want to make sure that if you are giving something to try and reverse that seizure that it's not adding to the effect of your magnesium therapy. Um, so watch for overtreatment because you'll depress their respiratory centers and that person um, will not breathe. And then you have a worse situation. Okay, so polytherapy. So if you're giving mag and then you, you, know, you wanna be careful of giving anything else that causes respiratory depression. Okay, so um, be sure you check fetal heart tones. All right, so um, I've had two incidences of seizure. I believe one was an epileptic seizure. It was not related to preeclampsia. And the other one was definitely an eclamptic seizure, but it didn't occur until um, after mom was postpartum, the baby was already out. So that kind of changed our picture a little bit. The woman who had eclampsia, no, I'm sorry, epilepsy, um, it was a really just interesting story. She was eight to nine centimeters. We were getting ready to push really, really soon. Um, I even remember the doc who was there. It was really, you know, kind of a nice afternoon until everything happened. But she said to me while she was um, in between contractions, I don't feel right. So the first thing that I did, I made sure I had the fetal hearts locked on. I put a pulse ox on her and I let her cuff cycle for her blood pressure. I got a set of vitals just before she started tonic clonic convulsions. Um, but we kept, I managed to keep the baby on the monitor, I managed to keep her on the pulse ox, and she really never desatted below um, 94%, which was good. Um, but as soon as she was, I was able to get a mask on her, I did put one on her. I think the episode lasted 36 seconds, I timed it. Um, eclamptic seizures typically are self-limiting, they are not always self-limiting, um, but they last typically three to four minutes at the most. Um, but you still want to check the fetal heart tones because there can be fetal asphyxiation um, if mom goes into respiratory acidosis. That baby will get less oxygenated blood. Um, okay, so when mom is postictal, and I know spell correct is going to do something weird. Um, nope. Okay. We're going to check for vaginal bleeding, which would indicate an abruption. 
Again, we're going to cover that later. We're going to check for ruptured membranes. Um, we're going to check and see if she's made any labor progress. So contractions, cervical dilatation. Now, it's one of these anecdotal things that if you've been a labor nurse for any length of time, if your patient is in labor and she really has preeclampsia or eclampsia, um, there's something that happens that really kind of speeds that labor along. It's like the baby sends out stress signals and somehow that sort of stimulates these women tend to spit these babies out like really, really fast. Not always. And magnesium will slow labor down because it relaxes smooth muscle. The uterus is made of smooth muscle. Um, however, we're going to check and see if she's made any labor progress. Now, if she's 23 weeks, that event might have irritated the, the uh, muscle tissue in her uterus to the extent where she is now delivering. Um, on the other hand, if she is a labor patient, we're trying to get her delivered, and she's not making progress. If she's seizing, we're probably going to go and get her to the back. So the next thing we're going to really do is prepare for delivery. This may be a vaginal delivery, but more likely, if we're really worried about mom's status and she's already eclamptic, we're no longer really concerned with expectant management, we're probably going to take her to the OR for C-section uh, um, and get that kid out. So NICU needs to be notified, um, and you really need to be able to move kind of fast. And lastly, support the patient and the family. Um, it is a scary, scary thing to watch someone have a seizure when you weren't expecting it, especially if you are in the hospital um, having a baby. Even if you know that your pregnancy is complicated and somebody's telling you you have this preeclampsia and you're really, you know, you know that something's not right, um, you can get really freaked out when something like this happens. And um, it can happen in the postpartum period. And that was another thing that I wanted to tell you about. This is a unit on antepartum care. But um, preeclampsia and eclampsia can complicate um, the postpartum period, especially the immediate postpartum period. And I'll tell you my favorite postpartum story, my favorite preeclampsia story. Um, I had a patient, she's a labor patient, and um, one of my favorite doctors was on again. And I was taking her blood pressures, and she was a skinny little thing. She was 17 years old, and um, no swelling at all, not your typical preeclamptic. Um, but she did have some high pressures, and they were like 154 over 92. They were in that sort of mild preeclampsia range, but her DTRs were super brisk, and every time I tapped her, I thought, ooh. She wasn't complaining of um, headache or blurred vision, but there was just something about her. She looked kind of sick, um, and those DTRs really kind of freaked me out. And her pressures were kind of climbing, and now she's like 162 over 90-something, and still not in that severe preeclamptic range. But I called the doc, and I said, look, do you mind if I just draw a set of PIH labs? Um, even though we don't call it PIH anymore, we still call the labs PIH labs, just because force of habit. So I drew um, a CBC. I drew the CMP, which included the liver enzymes and the uric acid, and um, we drew some coags. Um, and that was sort of our, and a urine protein. Urine came back positive for protein, not a surprise. Liver labs were slightly elevated. AST, ALT were slightly elevated. LDH was a little higher, um, but nothing super scary. It was just something about her, the way she like kind of looked a little bit glazed over. Um, and again, those reflexes. So she has her baby. Baby ended up going to NICU for some other reason, just respiratory. Um, didn't want to transition into being a newborn. Well, we're taking her upstairs in the elevator. Her pressures had dropped a little on postpartum and then they kind of rebounded again. And now she's like 150s over 80s again. And I'm concerned about her, but it's time to move her upstairs to postpartum and let them be concerned about her. So I've got her in the wheelchair and she's in the elevator. And of course she's on her phone because everyone's always on their phones. And she's snapping pictures of herself and, you know, dim lighting, the flash kept going off. And it was flash, 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 flash. She had to like, up date her, you know, Twitter chat or Snapchat or whatever she was on. Well, I get her out in the hallway, um, and now I'm really like, I just want to kind of drop her off and go back to my next patient, because I knew they were getting an admission. And I get her up to postpartum, and in the hallway, she starts jerking, um, just on the one side, like it was the left arm and the left leg, but just jerking and unresponsive and, um, 
I looked at her mom. I'm holding her in the chair to keep her from falling out of the chair. And her mom, I said, has she ever done this before? And she said, no. And her mom looked really scared. So I'm wheeling her into um, the unit on postpartum. The doors had opened. I'm wheeling her past, trying to kind of hold her into the chair. And I said, I need you to call me a rapid response. And they looked at me. I said, but she's on her phone. She was already back on her phone snapping more pictures. It was just the weirdest thing. Um, but when we got her into the bed, her pressure was 180 over 114. And so now we were able to um, do the magnesium sulfate. And we kept a pretty close eye on her after that. I wasn't able to go back downstairs to labor. I just stayed and um, kind of held her as a one-to-one. -one. And we um, sort of stabilized her on a presaline in addition um, to get the pressures down. But that, um, that is my eclampsia story. And you can imagine that if she were in a place where she couldn't get care, um, she would be in a very dire situation. Um, but anyway, those are the major hypertensive disorders. And as I said, we were going to study preeclampsia and eclampsia more. Um, we're not really going to talk about gestational hypertension as a separate phenomenon. There's really not um, that much more you do for it except to monitor for signs of preeclampsia. And we're not going to cover uh, chronic with superimposed preeclampsia, just know that that phenomenon exists and that um, the consequences can be often more severe because your babies are a little bit more compromised. Um, so we'll discuss the muddy points when we get into class and we'll move on to the other disorders. But it is important, I feel, that you have a good foundation in the diabetic disease um, in pregnancy and hypertensive disorders in pregnancy.